Dobrý deň, vítajte pri sledovaní relácie Portrét. Mojím dnešným hostom je výnimočný muž, ktorého celý svet považuje za otca coachingu. Je to človek, ktorý stojí za vedením ľudí. Niekdajší úspešný britský automobilový pretekár, dnes popredný poradca a mysliteľ, napísal niekoľko svetových bestsellerov a ešte stále verí, že všetky problémy ľudstva sú riešiteľné. Sir John Whitmore, dobrý deň, vítajte. Welcome. Thank you very much. Mr. Whitmore, I was wondering, to coach people, do you have to love people? Well, it helps a lot if you are nice to people. I think some people get too focused on the technique of coaching and forget that the quality of the relationship and the trust that exists between the coach and the person you're coaching is very important. Can you coach when you have personal issues which are not solved, in a way that you're not clear with yourself? Well, I think that a coach should be able to put these things on one side. I mean, professionally, we do need to be able, if we have a difficult day ourselves because something happened, you know, maybe your child had an accident in the, small, in the morning or something like that, you have to be able to put that on one side temporarily to do your job. And a coach who is well-developed will have the 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 self uh, management capacity to do that very well. And what kind of techniques did you develop to yourself? Well, I've had a long time since 1970 uh, studying not uh, academic psychology but psychotherapy and the actual techniques of doing that. So that is the background to my coaching is quite a deep experience. Did you experience with yourself as well? Oh, indeed. When you experience therapy, you are receiving therapy as well. So you're working on yourself and you're working sometimes on yourself and then sometimes you work with other people. That's just how we learn. So you have to be very open and free to be able to experience those things. And to tell the truth, sometimes it's yeah. painful. Yeah. And but in, a, in it, I mean the important thing then is to create a self a safe environment where you feel free to be honest and open. That's very important and uh, all coaches should be able to do that and to create that situation when they are coaching people. Do you remember the moment in your life when you've been called a coach the very first time? <laughs> Well, it was interesting because I was doing this really before the word coaching was being used. So in those days, we didn't really know whether to call it coaching, but because we used it in the early days on sport rather than business, we called it coaching for that reason, because the word was associated with sport. Later, Uh, only three or four months later, I had a person who was a trainer for IBM at the time who was a tennis player and he came on a tennis program that I was doing and he said then, oh, we want to do this with our training because this is what we need to learn um, to be able to be more effective with people. And so I just kept using the word coaching <laughs> <laughs> and uh, other people Uh, did the same and in America people were saying coaching because they also had their connection to sport again. So it, it, is, it does have an origin in sport except the methodology that we are using now yeah. with business is more modern psychologically than sport was because that's been the same for a long time. Was it business people who could afford coaching and that's why it started with them? Yes, it is, because um, in America there was more expendable income, as they say. They had more income and they could easily spend that on getting personal guidance and personal help. And uh, people in America were more accustomed to buying that help in for themselves. And we found that that was quite difficult in Europe to do that. And that we started working with companies and saying not we were coaching individual executives, but really training managers to use coaching as a management style. Then, of course, we did begin coaching individuals because they could see the benefit. So it grew out of that, but it was different because of the financial capacity that yeah. existed in America, but not in Europe. Did you ever do life coaching yourself? Well, certainly um, not. Um, 
I mean, I, I generally, I, I would not use that professionally because I had to limit it. I, I could be in coaching every day, all day. Yeah. So somewhere I had to put some boundaries. And one of the boundaries I did was to say that I'm, not going, to, I'm going to work professionally with business, but not life coaching. But uh, I, of course, I helped friends of mine and that sort of thing. I would, I would do it if necessary, but I didn't set up a business of life coaching. <laughs> yeah. You are also smiling. I wonder how fun it is to coach executives. Is it well, fun in a way? You know what I love seeing is people, when they make realizations and they move forward themselves, the great thing about coaching, we are not telling them what to do. So if they find a way forward that is valuable to them, they have found it themselves. And they get very excited about that. And I love seeing the pleasure of people who make a realization from their own understanding of something that they didn't understand before, but because they have discovered it in our conversation, not that I told them. You're telling me that you don't do life coaching, but I know that while you coach people, at a certain point, I guess, with every client, even if it's a top high executive, mm. you've got to the personal stuff. Oh, absolutely, because there is no division between work and life, really, it's part of life. And very often there are people who have problems with their workplace, partly because they've got a problem at home. So you cannot avoid uh, coming there. I mean, I've had people who said, I've got a business problem. I had one person who said, I'm impatient with my staff at work. I'm not patient enough. Can you coach me on that? And uh, within five minutes, they were talking about their relationship with their son. And this woman who wanted to manipulate her son to be thinking differently, but it had started as a business excuse, but then it got on this Just private situation. On and quite often it goes private when people say, <laughs> they want the company to pay, but they want to solve their own problems. Definitely, and you, then you come with the holistic stuff. Yeah. How much do they accept it, that they have to work on their soul, not only on those numbers? Yeah. Well, it is challenging to get people to think outside the box, as we call it. I mean, we, we tend to make a little box around our lives and say, this is where I live inside here. And when we get into what we call whole system thinking, we have to be able to include other things which are contextual, if you like, or other things that may or may not have influenced us when we were children, that has distorted our way of thinking in some way. You know, it's, uh, it's very important for a coach to have the ability to accept their full responsibility, which is managing the person in their own uh, uh, struggle with maybe saying something and being able to help them in a way that they can remember it and do something about it. So there is a lot of people skill in being a good coach. So, but a manager who is managing in a coaching way, it's much easier. It's fairly simple to do that. You have to use your intuition while working as a coach. And I believe there is a certain temptation be strict and really not to manage questions in a way that you would either give advice or point on things that you might think are important. How do you deal? Well, I'm always looking at what is best for this person. And I am quite happy to go away from the strict interpretation of coaching and say what this person needs right now is this and that may not be coaching but this is what I can see that they need. So I and mean do you I tell have, them? Oh yeah, I, I, I would say but what I hope is that if I can come for example to give a piece of advice I can give them some advice but I can do it in a coaching way. I mean I might say to you well I had a problem like that month, once do you want to know what I did with it? So I'm still saying that you have responsibility here. You can say yes or no, that's okay. So I can sort of offer those kind of things because I don't want to take responsibility away from the coachee. 
But an experienced coach will be able to manage those things. It sounds difficult when we talk about it now, but I would say that it's actually easier than people think because you really just have to be open and be natural and to be honest. That's really what people are looking for. Sometimes it's difficult to be honest with yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, we all have that problem yeah. from time to time. But. Are children coachable? Oh, absolutely, yes. Is it I easier mean, than adults? Um, I would say in many ways, yes. Children are more honest than adults. <laughs> no, I do think children respond very well to coaching. I think they're quite pleased because they're very accustomed to being told to do this and to do that. And if you ask a child a question, they know you are interested in them and they like to open up. I, I find children respond and, uh, uh, and take in coaching process quite easily, most of them. Do you enjoy it, coaching Oh yeah, kids? I do enjoy coaching children. I also enjoy it for another reason, that I feel um, that it's so important to help the next generation who are dealing with this changing world we have, and we have got a difficult world now with the climate change and the, all the uh, economic problems and, and that sort of thing. It's a burden on them. It's difficult, and those children are going to have to live in the world which we are going to live behind. So I would, I'm very passionate about helping children. You work very close with people who design or redesign educational systems. Mm. How does it work? Because I, I know you have connections in China when mm. you're trying to do your job, and then you really hardly try in the in, in UK mm. to change something mm. that had been unchangeable for ages. Yeah, and it is difficult because we, there is authorities on education have traditional ways of doing things and they're quite rigid and quite stuck in doing things in a certain way as they always have done. And those things are, are not the best for education. So we always have a difficulty. It's the same with healthcare, for example. I mean, you know, the, the personal behavior of the person in there is very, very important. Mm -hmm. And so a nurse can see somebody who is sick and the way that nurse speaks to the person may be very important and maybe more important than the medicine, you know. So we, we just really give a lot of importance to that personal relationship and that's very important with children. Because if children are going to talk openly, they've got to feel safe. They've got to trust you. And uh, I enjoy that process with children. Mm. It's a pity that we don't have emotional intelligence or people skills as mm. subjects at school. Well, what would change I mean, if we would have them? Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think that these things will come in education. How but long when it's you going to take? Well, but you just when you have a very large institution, I mean, if you have a small business, for example, you have a small business employing 20 or 30 people, I mean, within one week you can change the whole culture of that organization because you just, you talk to them, you say, this is why we want to do this, this is how you will like it better if we do this, and so on and so forth, and you can do that. But when you have a large company of 4,000 people who have done things in a certain way for a long time, it's much harder for them to change. Explain to us what you're trying to change in the European Union with the driving license mm. project. Well, the driving license problem is, is a very serious one because it's all over the world. But the problem is that um, young men, young male uh, people, when they're beginning to drive at about 18 years old on average in most countries, they learn how to drive because you know what young people with... Uh, uh, rollerblades and boards and all those things. They can learn those things very quickly. The problem is not their skill to be able to turn the wheel and change gear. Yeah. The, the problem is their emotional condition because they can become aggressive. If somebody does something in front of them, they can be aggressive or they want to be competitive. They want to drive faster than somebody else in another car. They want to pass them or something. Uh, we they, thought it's a question of age. 
Well, yes, because of the age, it, this happens very much, it, I mean, it's very serious in, in the age group between 18 and 22 years old. That is the highest accident rate all over the world, actually, of drivers in that age group. And it's all male. Uh, women don't have that problem. And uh, they say that the frontal lobe of a male person develops a little more slowly and that is their um, management of dangerous situations. That de it develops more slowly in a boy than it does in a girl. And this is probably because we have to go and fight wars every now and again, <laughs> and therefore it's probably not yeah. a bad idea. But, you know, but uh, I would say this is th that is an excuse also, because you can train people to become more mature. I mean, children can, if you give them the opportunity to learn how to be self-responsible, which you have to do not by telling them to be more responsible, but allowing them to make choices and, and, and learn from and what happens from that? them. Well, you give them choices in life. I mean, take a very simple example. When, you take, when a parent takes a child out for a walk, the parent will tend to say, now put on your sweater and put on the right shoes and then we will go out. That is a mistake. The parent should just go out with the child and allow the child to do what the child wants to do. And the child might put on a coat or it might not. It might put on too many sweaters. <laughs> and that's what, you allow the child to do it and then when they say, mom, I'm cold or mom, I'm too hot, then you say, Okay, what do you want to do? You want to leave a sweater here and pick it up on the so way it's, home? It's the experience we're missing out, yeah? Yeah, it's what we have to do with children is to give them a choice and then they experience the consequence of that choice. The consequence is they got too cold or something like that. They got wet because they didn't have a, the right coat on. And that's their experience. That's what they learn from. They do not learn from a, a parent saying, you should have put on something. And which, uh, which limiting beliefs did you have to overcome yourself as a person? Well, I suppose my first limiting beliefs is that, uh, am I good at doing anything? And, you know, I made, I mean, in the early days with coaching, I found that I made with uh, somebody some progress, and then I didn't make more progress, and, oh, what did I do wrong, and those sort of things. <laughs> yeah. I think you have to be very honest with yourself. You have to know what you are, your own limitations. Can we coach ourselves? Can we help? Well, absolutely we can, and I think it's actually, I think I find it very beneficial to do so, but the real secret is to ask the questions to yourself that would be challenging if somebody else asked you those questions. Oh, so, <laughs> you know, sounds difficult. It, it, a good way to do it is to find the difficult questions to answer, because then you're going on new territory. And then you face it. Yeah, and then you have to face so it. So you, you have cross to be honest the zone so. from yeah. the comfort zone. Mm -hmm. you, you jump to the stretch zone, then mm -hmm. maybe to panic zone. <laughs> panic zone is okay. Well, actually, Solutions I, happen quite, in panic I don't zone. really get in panic so, uh, no? myself because I actually enjoy coaching myself. I mean, I actually I enjoy challenging myself. <laughs> so then how do you deal with not facing the truth, laziness, not now, later? Well, all those things. I mean, I, 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 I mean, I don't have those sort of difficulties myself. But you know, I, I meet people who have those kind of difficulties. So, I mean, if somebody's lazy, I, I could say to them, um, you know, what is behind the laziness? You know, I, I, you know, are you afraid of something, or are you afraid of getting tired, or are you afraid of uh, people thinking? Uh, that you should do more, I mean, what, what is the reason? So I explore with them what the reason is, and then I might say to them at a certain point, how do you think I can best help you here? Now that's a good thing to say to somebody, because then they feel they are really part of the solution. And when they've solved this problem, or when we've had this discussion, and they now feel good about it, you know, it's quite helpful to say that, oh, thank you for solving, when they say, thank you for solving my problem, <laughs> I say, <laughs> yeah. did I solve it or did you solve it? Yeah. Other companies or sectors you would not coach? 
Um, oh, I, there's certain sectors I wouldn't coach. I, I'm very um, concerned about, I mean, in the end, my values are global values. Not, I don't have absolute um, value towards my client. I mean, I will do everything to help my client, but if my client is do, doing something that's bad or illegal or something like that, I, 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 will, I will not cross that line. So um, I'm quite tough with that. And for example, I would not work with a tobacco company because to Just me... Because smoking is killing people? Yeah, no, I mean, to me, I mean, I could say there are businesses that are white, which means they're very clean, they're doing good work, and it's helpful. On the other end of that spectrum, there's businesses that are black. And I would say uh, that uh, smoking tobacco um, uh, suppliers, um, I would say that it's completely black. There's no value at all in, in, in smoking of any sort. It only damages your health, it damages other people's health. After so many years <laughs> watching you writing books, you, you have a very, very successful book. It's, it's more than half a million copies of the no, coaching. No, it's uh, 600,000 copies. Congratulations. Actually in 27 different languages. 27 languages. And yeah. I know that we do have it in, in Czech language as well. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, not in Slovak. But after so many years, decades of working with people, mm. my question is, what is the intention behind all of this hard work? Mm. Why are you doing this? Well, it's, it, coaching is a way of helping people take more self-responsibility and, and, and therefore they perform better and they feel better themselves. So there's a part of coaching is that it gets people to feel much more comfortable with what they're doing and very often they're more productive in business of doing that. So all that is, is good anyway. But also, I would say it's very, very important that we consider other people in our world, which may be other people in our, where we live, or it may be everyone in the world. If you're working with a very large company, that company may be producing raw materials in another country. And uh, for example, there was a problem with some uh, companies that were making clothing in Asia and they were using uh, slave labor for the children yeah. were working for 16 hours a day getting paid almost nothing to make clothes for large western companies to sell to western people and this is totally dishonest and uh, so we, if a company was doing that and they came to me and said would I do some work with them I said yes I'd be happy to do that but this, this, and this will have to change immediately. Until we've done that, I won't discuss any further contracts. So you're changing the world in a certain way? Oh, um, well, I mean, I, th I feel that I'm fortunate enough to be in this world, and uh, I've had a, 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 a nice life so far, and I want to make sure that other people have a good life, you know. And where is the personal point of your satisfaction? I get a lot of satisfaction when I see people really appreciating themselves more. I think a lot of people are very self-critical and I think it's very good when people can be honestly recognized that they are not as bad as maybe they were told by their school teachers or whatever, you know, and they can feel good about themselves. And those people actually are the people who then contribute to other people. And so they are trying to help other people then, and that's very important. I know that coaches should not give advice, mm. but my last question goes, if you would have to advise humanity mm. to make a shift mm. which is needed, mm. what would you be? Well, there's so many different things because I say it's all whole system thinking. I think one of the biggest problems that humanity has at the moment uh, is, is people are afraid. I think a lot of business people are afraid because they're not good enough performers and that sort of thing. I think a lot of people are afraid and fear does not help your quality of life or your performance. So I would be looking at um, 
uh, trying to limit, limit fear in some way. And the way I would do that if I was coaching individuals is, what are you afraid of? But I would also say that with a team. We, we, when we are working with, with management, we sometimes work with the whole team and say, OK, let's have an open conversation now. I want each of you to say three things that you're afraid of when you're at work. And then we can start a conversation about these things. And uh, people feel so much better sometimes if they can be honest with their friends and say, yeah, I did feel it's afraid relieved. about this. They feel relieved, exactly, when they can say that. And what we find is that if somebody is willing to be open and share a discomfort or a pain or something stupid that they've done, when they share it with another person, half of it goes away already at that point when they can say it, whew, they feel better immediately. So I, I find I, it's a very rewarding uh, work to do uh, to help people through the coaching process. But I have to come back to the fact that we are going through this state of evolution where humankind is moving from autocracy and hierarchy to greater degree of democracy and self-responsibility that since self-responsibility is the primary uh, product of coaching, I feel that that's a way of contributing to the evolution of humankind when we are working with this process. I wish you good luck <laughs> and health on that journey. <laughs> thank well, you very much. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure okay. talking to you. Okay, I've enjoyed it too. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Okay, bye. Dámy a páni, našim dnešným hostom v relácii Portrait bol Sir John Whitmore. Thank you.